Take your Bibles and turn over to Genesis chapter 1. So for full disclosure, uh, this is, I think, the first topical slash thematic message I preached at Grace Bible Church of Tampa in a long time, maybe 10 years or more. As a matter of fact, I can't remember the last topical message I did. So uh, I am treading into uh, uncharted waters, or at least waters that I haven't done in a long, 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 long time. Some people say, well, what's wrong with topical messages? Topical messages aren't all bad. Thematic messages can be good, but there's a lot of fear that comes into teaching a topical message. You know why? Because as a pastor, I have to make sure I don't rip passages out of their context to make it say what I want it to say. So doing a thematic or a topical message like this can really be scary because I'm going to stand before the Lord with what I say and I make sure I want to make sure that I only say what it says and what God meant when he said it. Does that make sense? So y'all are all praying for me, right? Thank you. Our statement of faith makes a very clear uh, description and uh, explanation of human sexuality, and we have put this on our website, and it's uh, in the expanded form. I'm going to read it to you real quickly so that you understand where we stand, and this will kind of lay the groundwork for us. It says, We believe that God has commanded that no intimate sexual activity be engaged in outside of marriage between a man and a woman. We believe that any form of homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, bestiality, incest, fornication, adultery, and pornography are sinful perversions of God's gift of sex. We believe that God disapproves of and forbids any attempt to alter one's gender by surgery or appearance. And then there are several scriptures that are listed. And then, and we'll go over some of those tonight. And then second, it says, we believe that the only legitimate marriage is the joining of one man and one woman. This is what we say. This is what we believe. This is what we believe the Bible says. And we will stand on this. No matter if it's culturally relevant or not or whether or not it will get us in trouble, we have to stand on what the scriptures say. So this is what our statement of faith says. So the the question is, And this is where we start. What does God think of the LGBTQ movement? What does God think of this movement? First of all, we must start with a few qualifiers so we aren't misunderstood. First, this is not our opinion of what God thinks of these people and their lifestyle. It is our goal to look at Scripture and find out what Scripture says because God's Word is the only thing that really matters, not our opinion or our opinion of what God thinks. It's what God says and what His Word says. We seek to know what God's Word means in its original context. We know that there are subjects that don't translate well over time. There are things that are required in certain times that aren't required today. Things that are forbidden from previous times that aren't forbidden today. So some might say, does that mean that Homosexuality and some of these things were a cultural and time issue. And so the Bible might have spoke about them, but now it's not that way. But we believe that the Bible, God's view, has not changed on this issue. It has been consistent from the very beginning, and that is very crucial. We know that there are many who seek to revise original cultural and historical context in order to justify this lifestyle. This is very common in mainline denominations. Many of them have gone down this road of taking passages and because it's culturally different now, so therefore it makes it okay. But we believe that this revisionism is not what we should do. We should stick with what Scripture says and stay exactly with what it's been consistently from the very beginning. Second, this is not an attempt to elevate this sin to the top of the list of sins against God. All sin is worthy of God's judgment, correct? And Jesus died for this sin as well as other sexual sins that heterosexual people do and engage in. As Isaiah 6 states, God is holy, holy, holy. And any sin in the presence of God 
is worthy of death. God can't and does not want unholy people, right? God wants sin to be dealt with. One sin was enough to condemn all... One sin was enough to condemn all of humanity. One sin. Think about that. Read Romans 5. Adam and Eve, Adam's sin, that one sin is why we all are born what? Dead in sin. One sin. I could argue, and some of us might argue, that one disobedient act of eating a piece of fruit that God says not to eat is definitely not as bad as some of these sins that we're talking about tonight. But the fact of the matter is, is it led to the whole condemnation of all of mankind. So we need to be very careful and understand that, correct? Third, this is not an attempt to be self-righteous and elevate ourselves over those who engage in this lifestyle. While it's true to a degree, we are all to a degree self-righteous. The goal and aim of every true believer is holiness, correct? We want to be holy. We want to be holy as our Father is holy, as 1 Peter states. We, are, we all admit that we are in need of the gospel, don't we? We all admit that we are all born sinners and in need of a Savior. We all need to repent and believe. And by the grace of God, after conversion, we are all in the process of putting to death all of our sins, right? Whatever they are, admittedly, in here, we all struggle with some sins more than others, right? Everybody agrees with that. And But by the grace of God, in the child of God, we're able to put to death sin and reach other people and give them hope, too, to come out of whatever sin that is. Because God is that kind of God. He's a gracious God. He's a kind God. He can deliver us. Those that were thieves beforehand don't have to continue to be thieves because God's grace is working in us, right? And this is how we have to view it. So it's not an attempt for us to be self-righteous. It may take time to battle it, correct? Whatever that sin is. But the gospel, specifically the person and work of Jesus, can set us free from the bondage of sin. Fourth, this is not an exhaustive message. And I want you to get this. As I started thinking on this topic, do you understand? I could probably preach 15 sermons on this. There's so much to talk about and think on and meditate on. And this is, I'm just giving you a little snippet, okay? There are many, many good resources out there to help us to fill in the gaps and understand these things. I, I want to recommend one resource in specific, and you ought to write this down. Kevin DeYoung's book titled Homosexuality is Excellent, excellent book. I read it this week, or most of it this week, and it was really, really good. And I have to admit, I'm taking a lot of his stuff. It's excellent. So if you have any questions afterwards, I'm available to hopefully answer some questions, but I would recommend you read the, Kevin's book on this. So where do we start? Well, I think we need to start with this basic axiom, this basic truth. What is the purpose for man? What is the chief end of man? It is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, right? That's what the Westminster Catechism says. This truth is revealed countless times and countless ways in the Scriptures, isn't it? That we are to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We were made to make much of God, right? It's mentioned several different th ways. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 10, Whatever you do, whether it's eat or drink, do all things for the glory of God, right? Make much of God and delight in Him. So how does this apply to the subject? Well, it starts with who is God? God is the creator. God is the one that made us. God is the one that made male and female in his image, correct? Turn over to, as we were talking about in, in Genesis chapter 1, let's read it in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what do we see here? God created man and woman, male and female, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. 
God created us to be a reflection of His creatorship, of who He is. We're supposed to show off who God is in who we are and what we do. As we do certain things, we're going to show off this image. We're going to show off God and show off that He's the creator. Now look at what God made the man and the woman to accomplish. Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and what? Multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it. And to rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky. There are two functions that humanity is listed as required in accomplishing or doing in order to do what? To reflect who God is and to worship Him and to glorify Him. Right at the beginning, we see how we can glorify God. How male and female can glorify God. By what? Reproduction, multiplying, and ruling over. Those are the things that God created man and showed that this is a way for us to reflect the glory of God from the very beginning. Men and women reproduce and men and women rule over the animals. God made a being that had his image and they are able to reproduce. They are commissioned with reproducing and ruling over the rest of the creation. Reproducing points to the ability of mankind to make other humans. This isn't the only purpose of marriage, but obviously this is a primary reason for marriage and why God put man and woman together. It is a primary reason. The union makes reproduction what? Possible. When male and females are together and they're married, they can do what? They can reproduce. And that was one of the reasons why God established it from the very beginning. God, and I know we're going to jump into the deep end here, God made the anatomy of the human body to make this possible. This makes sense, doesn't it? Now, it's a little difficult, and some say, well, why is it that way? Answer, that's how God did it. That's how God made it. He did make it that way. So every time a male and a woman, a man and a woman, come together and make an offspring, what do they do? They show off God. They glorify Him. I want you to think about the greatest thing you've ever created. What's the greatest thing you've ever created? I don't know about you, but maybe a couple of pieces of art when I was about five or six were pretty good. <laughs> but that piece of art never reproduced itself. That piece of art did what? Sat there and it's probably somewhere in a garbage heap somewhere now. Probably back to dust by now because it wasn't all that great. But God's creation, in an amazing way, was made to do what? To actually be able to reproduce itself. And every child that's made goes, it screams, God is an amazing creator. An amazing creator he is. And the act itself is all part of the process of doing what? Bring glory to God. When a male and a woman, a man and a woman come together... In its sexual intimacy, it is glorifying to God in the marriage bounds, in the way that God has established it. It does glorify God. It's a wonderful thing. He also made being a being that can come together and then make an offspring. It should, it, doesn't it scream God every time you see a baby born? I mean, that's why we ex or we're like, wow, another baby was born this week. Burritos had a baby, right? That's amazing. It's a great truth. Why? Because God created beings that were actually able to reproduce. They reflect the creator himself in that process. Now, I know there's a bunch of things that go through your mind. Well, then what about the single person? Or what about the person that does not have the, can't have children, and yet they, but still, listen to me. Just because those things don't always work and there's not always a marriage, it still was the way that it was established. And that was the purpose of the intimacy. That it was going to make it so that we could reproduce. This is, this is common, right? This is here in the text. When a husband and wife come together in sexual relationship and a baby is conceived, it screams, God is an amazing creator. I remember when I first saw Luke, or excuse me, Andrew, my first one, and saw him. One of the songs that I sang immediately was, 
How great thou art. How great thou art. What a God. Now, any distortion of that does what? It creates, it, it corrupts and distorts our Creator. It distorts that picture. Does this mean if sexual relationship happens and no baby is made that God isn't glorified? No, no, by no means. The loving act glorifies God in marriage even without the production of the baby because it's pointing to that same relationship that he established. Even if the relationship doesn't produce that every time, it's still pointing to that relationship that shows God. He made the marriage relationship. And any time that's distorted, we're distorting who? The creator that made that relationship. I think if you just started with Genesis and stuck with Genesis, we'd be okay with this whole message, wouldn't we? We'd be okay with just here. But if it's done outside the marriage relationship between a man and a woman, it also distorts this. And it's sin. And if it's done in a same-sex relationship, it distorts it. It's really not a one flesh act. Holding hands doesn't make a person a one flesh relationship. Any act outside of marriage relationship between one man and one woman is a distortion of God's intended purpose of becoming one flesh in marriage. Therefore, it doesn't glorify God the Creator. So, one of the arguments that a lot of people say is, is why doesn't the church make a big deal about divorce? Okay, I agree. The marriage relationship is important. We should lift it up, shouldn't we? It's no different. Anything that attacks the marriage relationship is what? An attack on the Creator God. I agree. We should make it just as serious. And it should be just as serious. Both are wrong. Two wrongs don't make a right, though, right? Just because one thing we might not come out as hard against, which we should. Does that make the other one okay? No, absolutely not. That's a logical fallacy. By the way, I believe the transgender is also attacking the creatorship of God. Hear me. They are saying, in effect, what I want to be is more important than how God has made me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, as Psalm 139 states, unless you're transgender and then you're saying what? I'm not really fearfully and wonderfully made. I'd like to change. I want to be something different. It's an attack on the Creator. Sadly, they are denying God's creatorship over them and not thanking Him and being satisfied with how He made them. And again, do we speak here, if we're really honest, do we speak here as if we've arrived in all these things? Have you ever looked at the mirror and said, man, I wish I'd look different? Well, some of it might have been our own discipline problem, right? But I know, I know. I look at my face in the mirror and see these glasses and think, man, I wish. But this is what God made me. This is how I am. And my hair came white early. And that's okay, because that's how God made me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and this is the way I am. Yep, I'm that white-haired, can't see, 52-year-old guy, almost 52, stumpy with a nice big belly, and I don't drink beer. Some of that is my own discipline, I admit, but this is also how God made me. We have to... We have to reflect and glorify God and who He's made us. By the way, we, we need to be careful of this as Christians that we can fall into some very small things doing the very same thing if we're not very, very careful. Who are we? We're made by God. And I'm thankful. We should be thankful. Bound up in Adam and Eve was the potential also for everyone in here to be born. What an amazing concept. God created Adam and Eve, and in them, in some amazing way, you were there. Isn't that profound? Look how big God is. He created a piece of artwork that could then fill the whole earth two times over. One time, flood wiped out. Let's do it again. 
What a God. What a God. And when we deny those things, we do what? We do not glorify and honor Him. We honor ourselves. We put our desires above His desires. Genesis 1 and 2 point to what God established as the normal relationship between men and women. Look over at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis points to what God wanted for His own marriages to be between one man and one woman. Let's read it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Another explanation, a fuller explanation, a description of the creation of woman. Then the Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. Verse 18, I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to all the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But Adam, but for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So God caused God, uh, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place the Lord fashioned into a woman the rib which had been taken from man and brought her to the man and the man said this is now bone of my bone flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman Because she was taken out of man, Isha, because she was taken out of Ish. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. What a relationship, right? You know, I've read over this so many times, and I've thought through this, and thought, well, why the naming of the animals? Why the animals show up? Have you ever noticed something? Look at it really closely. How was Adam made? How was Adam made? He was made out of what? Dust, dirt. God picked up some dirt. How were all the animals made? Verse 19. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. He did the same thing with the animals. But who came from Adam? The woman. He took a rib out of Adam to do this. This is very interesting. It means there's differences, but there's similarities. The differences were there for the compliment. To compliment Adam. To do what he couldn't do to help him in the area that he couldn't help them. Kevin DeYoung states it this way, quote, a different marital arrangement requires an entirely different creation account, one with two men and or two women, or at least the absence of any hints of gender complementarity and procreation. In other words, you can't have this complement idea. So what is this? It's an attack on what? The creation account and ultimately a cre- an attack on who? The creator. But we were made... To what? Glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. So what do we have? God made Adam from dirt. God made Adam animals from the dirt. God, Adam named the animals. And then God made Eve from Adam's rib. God made the woman to be a perfect complement for Adam. The woman is the complement for the man. They are a perfect complement for each other. This is God's amazing creatorship. He made the man and the woman to work together perfectly. A perfect set, a perfect complement. Adam didn't need another Adam. (laughs) He didn't. And I'm not trying to be rude or crude or anything like that. He made the one that fits. He did it intentionally. This is not just some side joke. You know, you hear it, the Adam and the Eve not Adam and Steve and those things. It's not a joke. This is really how the Bible speaks. This is really what the Bible says. The Bible really says this. The male and woman are the complement of each other. It's perfect. It sets perfectly together. This is how God did it. And we all in the room say, Amen. Praise God. This is how He did it. 
Woman is both similar to man, taken from him, but different from man, fashioned from him to be a complement to him. As DeYoung states, quote, a new creation fashioned from the side of man to be something other than man. A woman is different than man. Every woman in the room says, and every man in the room says, they are different, aren't they? As I said, Jesus reaffirms this order. He says it. Matthew 19, who does he quote? He quotes this story. He says, and he answered, Jesus answered and said, Have you not read that he created them from the beginning? He made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined, let no man separate. God just affirmed, uh, the Lord Jesus affirmed what? The Genesis account. He did it. He said it. Notice Jesus points to the relationship spanning the ages. This is Jesus thousands of years later, after the creation account, still saying, this stands. This is the way it is. He says this is the part of the created order. This is the way it is. Marriage between a male and a female. Two become one flesh. They leave their parents and they become one flesh. Some have argued that Jesus never condemned homosexual relationships. He never mentions homosexual relationships. He does talk about immorality, though, and he does lift up marriage. This is not really completely true if you say that he never condemned it. Jesus didn't condemn it because he told and rehearsed what was the obvious created order. He kept saying it over, this is, this is the way it is. By the way, this was not debated. This was not debated. It, it, the revisionists might want to tell you that the Jewish people had a real hard time finding sin in homosexuality. You know what that is? A lie. It's a lie. Jesus wasn't up there going, hmm, I wonder if I am okay with these kind of relationships. He would have expressly declared it and pointed it out if there was any debate at all. When he brings up the created order and establishes it that way and says it's this way, it wasn't a debate. This was not an area of the, of, of the creation story that he wanted to change. He said this is the way it is. If we as parents, by the way, again, let's, let, let me illustrate this a little bit. And again, not every illustration works perfectly. But if Jesus says uh, uh, a marriage is between a man and a, fem- a male and a female, and the two become one, they leave their spouses, and the two become one, and this is the way it is, does that mean, well, because he doesn't say that you can't do the other, that it's okay? Can we assume that? Well, I'd answer no. If we as parents tell our kids, go out in the backyard and play on the trampoline until I say, come in, and instead they go to our neighbor's house and they jump in a swimming pool and they play there until we go back out and get them, what's going to happen to them? That's called discipline. It's going to come. Why? Because I told you what you're supposed to do with these kind of relationships. The one flesh relationship is between what? A male and a female. It's there. It's established. He said it. He approved it. This is it. If you go outside of that, you're doing what? You're really disobeying. Even the Lord Jesus. By the way, just, just a side note. If, if really there was one clear passage in the whole Bible and it only one said that it was wrong, what? What? It's still just as binding to be God's word. But there's more. There's plenty. There's lots of passages, actually. If you include the range of the immorality, the, 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 the idea of sexual immorality, it's way expanded. Well, one might say, I don't like this, <laughs> or this isn't fair. I have a desire that doesn't fit into this description. Ooh. Well, beloved, God is the creator, not us. He gives 
what he wants to give, and he withholds what he wants to withhold. He's not obligated to give us every desire that we have, is he? He's God. We're not. Plus, God knows what is best for us, and he gives us what we need. And he has our best interest at heart, even if we can't understand it, right? God loves us. God cares for us. Paul also alludes to this established created order in 1 Corinthians 11, 9. He says, For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Now, without getting into a great discussion on this, the reality is, is he's pointing to the created order, the way that God established things. This is it. It's established. Now, there's also some passages, look over to Leviticus chapter 18. There are some passages in the law that speak to this lifestyle also. I believe they're applicable today also, even though they're under the Mosaic law. Pastor Mike, you told us we're not under the law anymore. Why are you saying that these are still applicable to us? I'll explain in a second. Hang in there. Leviticus 18, 19. Look with me. Leviticus 18, 19. Okay, now this is when it becomes rated R. Also, you shall not approach a woman to undercover her nakedness during her menstrual impurity. You shall not have intercourse with your neighbor's wife to be defiled with her. You shall not give any of your offspring to offer them to Moloch, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It's a abomination. Also, you shall not have intercourse with animals to be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is a perversion. Admittedly, you can see this moves from uncleanness in the Mosaic Law... In verse 19, right, uncleanness, to the more important note of breaking the law and becoming an abomination. It goes further and further, and he shows how it goes down the thing. It's important to note that verse 19, if the Jews broke that command, and there's a whole, I could probably preach a whole message on that verse, and I'm not going to. You're like, all the ladies in the room say, thank you, I'm glad you're not. But do you know what the rule or what the consequence of breaking that rule was? Seven days you'd be unclean. That was it. All the others, guess what happens? They're stoned. Hmm. You think there was a difference in which one was worse than the other? One of them was called abomination. Right? Now, morally, these offenses are sin under Old Old Covenant, under the Old Covenant and the New Covenant also, though. The law of Christ restricts these just like the Mosaic law. We'll see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You can look there later. So one of the objections that comes is, but I, I love them, is what the homosexual might say. I love them. They love me. Well, it's important to note, A definition of love is important here. Very, very important. Love must be defined as seeking what is best for the other person. Love is seeking what is best for the other person. If I love someone, I will seek to do what's best for them, even if it means what? My hurt. So if you love someone, you will never cause them to do anything that distorts God's created order for them. Do they really love each other? Answer, no, they are hating each other by doing that. Now I know you're like, what? If I told a homosexual that, that they're hating each other, they wouldn't understand, would they? But again, what do we know? We know that we're all dead in sin. We're born dead in sin and we cannot understand the truth that where our joy, our real joy is found in in glorifying our creator God. 
But if they understand that Christ Jesus came into the world to die to pay for their sin, then they will do everything they can to protect the one that they so-called say they loved, they're committed to. And that would be to not be in a relationship with another man. Because it's an abomination. And that moral code goes through. Because after all, what does Jesus tell us? First great commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. If you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, you're, he's your creator, then what are you going to do? You're going to create his created order and you're going to glorify him. You're going to show him off with whatever you do. And if you're going to love your neighbor as yourself, you're never going to go into a relationship that could what? Cause them to hurt and be in an abomination and for them not to glorify God and enjoy him. What is it that we as spouses want for our spouse more than anything else? It's a tricky question. My greatest desire for my wife is that she glorifies God and enjoys him forever. I want her to glorify God. And I'm going to do everything I can do to help her to glorify God. To show off him. Anything I do that keeps her from doing that is what? Sin. I want my wife to love God, enjoy him. Make much of him. Oh, God, please forgive me for any of the times that I have not helped her glorify you. First and foremost, you should do this for God's glory because you love him. And second, you will do this because you love the person. You want them to know God and enjoy him forever. Again, but did Jesus say this law is not binding under my yoke? Well, I would say yes. Why? Because he says, love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And that's his new yoke, by the way. The law of Christ still compels us to do what? Do those same things. Some people break up the moral law, the civil law, the, the, the ceremonial law. I personally think oh, I just go with the law of Christ because the reality is, is the law of Christ is very clear. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he develops that throughout the New Testament, and the epistles do too. Are there some things that aren't binding on us? Yes. But are there some things that we will do because we love our neighbor? Or we will avoid because we love our neighbor? This is it. Isn't it ironic, though? Do you see the irony of it? That what does the agenda say ultimately to us? They say, I just want to love them. Do you see the blindness? They're actually hating them. They're hating each other. And they're not loving the God that made them. Leviticus 20, 10, and 14, 10 to 14 says the same thing. Look over there real quick. We'll read it. If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, by the way, just as serious, right? One who commits adultery with his wife, friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Do you think God takes that serious too? Absolutely. Is it a travesty that adultery happens in a church? Absolutely. May God have mercy and may it stop today. It's sin. If there's a man who lies with his father's wife, incest, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltness is upon them. If there's a man who lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. Incest. They have committed incest. Their blood guiltness is upon them. If there's a man who lies with a male, as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltness is upon them. If there is a man... Who marries a woman and her mother and her mother is immorality. Both he and they shall be burned with fire so that there will be no immorality in your midst. Do you think God takes these things seriously? Absolutely. Again, this is a clear explanation of the moral practices that deserve judgment. 
Mm, by the way, just a side note, this should control the way we as believers view them. We should understand that God doesn't like this and that they're under the judgment of God and it should what? Grieve us. Not make us self-righteous and think that we're better than them. It should grieve us. And it should cause us to have a love for them and a compassion for them so much so that we're willing to confront them in a gracious and kind way and point them to the good news of Jesus Christ who can deliver them. If you confront somebody with this, it's not because it should not be because you think you're better than them. If you confront them with this, you should be pointing them to the truth and giving them hope. Y'all have all heard the illustration. If you see a person burning up in a burning building, and you don't say, be well, okay, I'm not going to go bother them, don't want to bother them. You run to the house, you open the door, and you say, get out, your house is on fire. I love you, please come. That's what's happening. These things do not make us self-righteous. They humble us. And they break our hearts, don't they? To see a culture and a society that's going down this grieves me. Do you wake up every day saying, oh, this is so wonderful. No, we wake up going, ah, Lord, save. Help me. Help me, God. Be sharing hope with the lost. So some have said, well, isn't one sin the same as another sin? Here's the thing. Yes, all sins are worthy of judgment, but some sins bring a stricter and quicker judgment. And they have lasting consequences. In the Mosaic Law, we see this, don't we? Remember, if someone is stoned to death, they would face God's judgment in hell sooner. But God is merciful for some sins, and they're endured under His patient nature for longer periods. And we know from our passage just a couple weeks ago in Matthew that there's a swifter judgment for those that know a revelation of God and reject Him even more than Sodom, right? So be very careful. Isn't Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, a reflection that God takes this sin seriously? I believe it is. The sin of homosexuality was obviously rampant in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God wiped out that whole city. The sin of Sodom and the judgment that came upon it was an example. It was used as an example in the New Testament. Jesus brings it up. It's something that brings swift judgment. judgment. Now, I do admit a person can go their entire life and not ever even entertain a homosexual thought. And I want you to listen closely and spend eternity in hell. Did you hear me? Just because a person avoids one sin, they are not assured of avoiding God's judgment. There will be many, many, many heterosexuals in hell. Many. Our hope is not in how well we avoid one particular sin. Our hope is in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But this saving relationship with Jesus Christ means we repent of our sin, both at conversion and regularly thereafter. It's not just one sin that sends us to hell. It's not repenting and believing in Jesus. Now let's look at a New Testament passage, Romans 1. How's this going? Okay. Scared to death. I was thinking about this the other day. As I was preparing for this, I was thinking, you know, one day, poor, poor Daniel's going to have to come arrest me for this message. Hopefully not, right, brother? If so... We had a good discussion on whether or not the, the police officers are going to arrest us for this. You know it's happening in Europe. You understand that? 
You preach against this, you can be arrested. Woo, day's coming, right? What do you think? It's going to be on live stream. We're going to make sure it's on the website to understand. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, even if it means I'm in jail. Just being honest, because I love people too much. Romans 1.18. Watch how the created order is tied to this same sin. You'll see it again. Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Everybody knows there is a God that created things. It's obvious. There's no excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God and give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Here it is. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, second one, God gave them over to the degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire one man, for one another. Toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own person the due penalty of their error. Now we can twist this and try and try to shift it and try to make it something, say something else, but I'm sorry, beloved. Natural means natural, and this means that God's judgment for rejecting Him as their Creator is what? homosexuality uh oh you're kidding for this for the record this section is primarily about where we see God's righteous wrath being revealed in the lost world that's what this section's all about where do we see God's righteous wrath being revealed in the world today. That's what this section's all about. What's the conclusion? That anybody that is engaging in these kind of relationships are under the wrath of God. They are doing these acts as God's giving them over to the lust of their hearts because they have rejected the Creator God. Because they are not submitted to him, he hands them over. What does that mean? That means anybody that is in these kind of relationships are what? Lost and being judged by God. That's sad. good news there's hope there's hope in Romans chapter 3 the one who came into the world to be a propitiation of God's wrath that would appease the wrath of God for anybody that turned from their sin and trusted in him he starts with the pagan land in 18 and goes to the Jew and then to the self-righteous and he goes all the way to the end and then it, we find out that all of us are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And all of us need what? Jesus! 
We all need the gospel, don't we? We all need this hope, don't we? One thing's for sure. Some person might say, well, I don't participate in that, but I'm not going to stand in their way, and I approve of that. They're just as condemned to read verse 28 to 32. You see it. But it wouldn't be right for me if I didn't give this the right way and really do it so that we all walk out of here making sure we understand something. Listen to me closely. Look at it, verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to the depraved mind to do the things which are not proper. proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and they are gossips. Slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Let me ask you a question. What's the pronoun in this section? Fourth word in verse 28. They. They do this, they do that, they do this, they do that. How many of you in here say, they do that? And you know it's wrong. How many of you know this? All of us. Do you understand that as soon as you say, I know that this is wrong, you say there is a standard of righteousness, and therefore you condemn yourself. Because if there is a righteous standard, it's God's righteous standard, and every single one of us in the room fall short of that. Who needs a Savior? I do. That's Paul's point here. They, 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 they. Everybody in the room goes, they, 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 they. Nobody came here. Most of you probably didn't come here thinking, I don't have a problem with that sin. There's plenty more. And you know there's a sin. And you know there's a standard. And you fall short. And I fall short. And I need a Savior. So do we go to a homosexual and think that we're better? No, we go as broken, repentant sinners. Realizing that Jesus Christ is our only hope. And that to glorify Him is only found by faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your goodness towards us. Lord, I feel like I've only scratched the surface of this topic. and So aware of my own need, God. So aware of my own failings and so aware of my own sin. Oh, God, here we are. We're the unworthy dogs, the sinners. The ones who need and deserve your wrath. But, God, you, (laughs) you sent your son into the world to die for us. He rose from the dead to give us life. So that we could walk with you and put to death sin in our own hearts and our own lives and share hope to those that are bound up in sin and hurting each other. May you make Christ big in our hearts. Help us, God, to go and proclaim the glory of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. 
We pray this in his matchless name.